Good morning, everyone. So we're going to continue along here in Chapter 5. We'll probably come pretty close to finishing up the material that will be on midterm 2 here today so we can spend most of Friday. We'll probably have a little bit of, of topics at the start of class Friday to wrap up. But most of Lecture Friday and, and Monday will be spent reviewing topics for uh, midterm 2, which is next Tuesday in recitation. So today I thought what we would do is just kind of look at these two reactions um, that we had given here, calcium chloride um, dissolved into its ions. So I have uh, some calcium chloride solid here. I have a vapor of water. I have some digital thermometers in the water baths. Uh, and so my one thermometer is reading 21 degrees, so just room temperature water. The, uh, so I'm going to add some calcium chloride. Do you think the water temperature is going to go up or down? That would be the question. What do you guys think? And so the only times that we might get confused here is if we think of the negative side dropping, but think about how the reaction is going to release heat. The reaction is releasing heat into the water. The water temperature should go up. So the fluid temperature should increase here. It actually gave me a really large quantity of calcium chloride. So this isn't going to completely dissolve. I'll put some in there. I'm already at 30 degrees. So it went from 21 to 30 degrees already. I don't know if anybody wants to yeah, have Aaron take a look. That's definitely 30 degrees, right? Uh, yep, so it's definitely going up. It's at 38 degrees already. Maybe they told me if I put all of this in there, it'll go up to about 60 degrees. We'll go ahead and add all the solid. It's already at 42 degrees. And so what we can do with certain types of compounds, you can make a hot pack out of this. So if you've ever seen hot packs, it would just have a compound, probably water or some liquid, that that compound can mix in, dissolve, do some type of reaction that leads to an exothermic reaction. The exothermic reaction then heats up the solution. You can use that as a hot pack. Um, and then ammonium nitrate ought to do the opposite. Hopefully it does the opposite because we have an endothermic reaction. When the reaction takes place, it has to absorb heat. But that doesn't mean we see the temperature go up because we're looking at the temperature of the solution. The solution temperature is the surroundings of the reaction that will have lost its heat for the reaction to absorb heat to take place. The reaction absorbing heat from the solution, lowering its temperature. Hopefully that's what we observe. So I have, again, a large sample of ammonium nitrate. I think my thermometers aren't calibrated well because this one says 25 degrees. Um, I doubt the two water temperatures are really that different, so I think the calibration's off a little bit on our thermometers. I mix this one up. I can already feel it getting cold. It's already 13 degrees, 11 degrees, 10 degrees. And then that feels cold. But definitely feels cold. We made really an instant cold pack here. If we had done this in like a, uh, some sort of container that we could use for a cold pack, this could have been used to prepare a cold pack. I'm already below 5 degrees, about to go below 4 degrees. So definitely prepared a cold pack here. I was kind of curious if we would have enough of a temperature drop to freeze out this water. I doubt we will have enough of a um, heat absorbed in the solution to freeze the solution. But it looks like we're going to get pretty close to zero degrees. I, we can check back. I doubt this will freeze. We'll probably get close. I'm already at one degree C. So, so we're preparing here um, instant hot packs and cold packs, but hopefully seeing that the exothermic reaction releases heat into the solution, temperature goes up. And so what we can conclude here and seeing through this demo is that our exothermic reaction is increasing the temperature of the solution. So remember our solution temperature is what we're looking at. We're dropping the temperature of the solution for endothermic reaction. So the sign of delta H here was exothermic for the calcium chloride, was endothermic for ammonium nitrate. And then the solution temperature, this is our surroundings of the reaction. So whenever we ask you to consider the temperature, um, it's always going to be the surroundings because that's what's in contact with the reactants before the reaction and the products after the reaction takes place. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure we kind of did a, a quick little demo to show the difference between exothermic and endothermic and the resulting temperature changes that those have. Looks like my temperature's already going back up for the ammonium nitrate. I 
peaked out around 50 degrees or so, this is already starting to drop. So obviously we increase the temperature and then the reaction has completed and we're just going back towards room temperature. Okay, so what if we have a question like this one here where we have a reaction taking place. So how much heat is either released or absorbed when we have a certain quantity of H2O2, that's hydrogen peroxide, decomposing at constant pressure um, according to this reaction here where we have two moles of H2O2 forming two moles of water plus a mole of oxygen. The delta H here is indicated as minus 196 kJs. The reason probably we're told this is at constant pressure is just so that we know that this is the heat change of the reaction occurring at constant pressure. So the heat change of the reaction is given by delta H for this type of chemical system. That's always going to be the assumption too in this chapter is that our delta H corresponds to the heat gained or released by our reaction. And so what we have here is an exothermic reaction just from the sign of delta H being negative tells us we have an exothermic reaction. So this reaction is releasing heat to its surroundings. So the surroundings heat drops, surroundings heat increases. And so we're gonna have heat released by this reaction here, not absorbed. So heat's released, not absorbed. And then we would have precisely 196 kilojoules released if we had two moles of H2O2 undergoing this reaction. We only have five grams though. So how do we calculate the heat of this reaction? So what I would like to do, or what I would try to do, is calculate your Q reaction from delta H and just keep the sign of delta H. Don't necessarily yet reinterpret the sign of delta H. So let's calculate Q reaction where we take five grams of H2O2. We can use the molar mass of O2, so that'll be 32 for the two O's plus um, two, so this is 32.02 grams per mole, or excuse me, 34.02 grams per mole of H2O2. So we just have to use the molar mass of H2O2. And then the most important number and thing to recognize or to recall is that our delta H given for this reaction of minus 196 kJs corresponds to the coefficients being moles. That corresponds to two moles of H2O2, forming two moles of water and a mole of O2. So the minus 196 is connecting or related to two moles of H2 reacting. And I just keep the sign of delta H, and I can reinterpret the meaning of the sign after we get the value for the heat change of the reaction. So 5 divided by 34.02 times negative 196, but divide by 2, is minus 14.4. And a few things that kind of take in from the sign and the meaning of Q reaction, the meaning of delta H, is the delta H is the, the enthalpy change of the reaction. And so it tells you the heat change of the reaction. Yeah, so that's why we're calculating Q reaction off of delta H keeping its sign is because that's the heat change of the reaction. Now if the reaction loses, drops here, if it loses 14.4 kJs of heat, that's the heat that goes into the surroundings. So the heat of the surroundings is always the opposite of the sign of the Q reaction. So the heat of the surroundings here is plus 14.4 kJs. So this is always going to be true here, that the heat of the surroundings is always the opposite of the sign of the Q reaction. So if Q reaction is negative, then our Q surroundings here is going to be positive. The reaction loses heat, the surroundings gains the heat. So we have 14.4 kJs of heat released by the reaction that's then absorbed into the surroundings. Sometimes I like to think of heat as like money, yeah, so an example or I, I like to kind of compare this type of problem to is if you had gone to the casino and um, I, you know, if you came back, I wouldn't say, what was your money change? Was it negative or positive? That's a weird way to say it. You would say, did you win money or did you lose money? And so think of reactions the same way. We usually like to track their heat. Did the 
reaction, uh, absorb heat or release heat, and you almost make heat a positive quantity sometimes by the way you ask the question. You just add the word release means that the Q reaction was negative and absorbed. The reaction absorbing heat would mean that that was heat absorbed, so the Q reaction would be positive. So sign conventions on Q, definitely something to, to see. A lot of examples on the daily quizzes will kind of have what's the sign of delta H, positive or negative, or what's the sign of the Q reaction, how much heat is absorbed or released into the surroundings. Okay, let's get into the topic of calorimetry, because calorimetry is how ultimately we're going to see how a lot of delta H's are measured in the lab. You guys will do an experiment about this too. And so we kind of start the topic off in the, with an equation we've seen before which is that heat is just related to MCS delta T. Now this equation is useful when you have a pure substance. Um, so if you have a pure substance like, let's say, you know, aluminum, aluminum has a specific heat of 0 0.90 joules per gram Kelvin. That corresponds to the heat it takes the number of joules to raise one gram by one Kelvin. So to go from, you know, for aluminum, um, it's a little bigger. So for aluminum here, as uh, a gas, I guess. So the, the gaseous aluminum, 0 0.90 joules has to be absorbed for one gram to go up by one Kelvin. Let's look at water liquid. Water liquid has to absorb 4.18, I can add another number here, you may have seen this before, 4.184 joules for one gram of water to increase by one Kelvin. So one gram of water must absorb 4.184 joules of energy or heat to increase its temperature by one Kelvin. So it'll go up by one Kelvin. 4.184 joules of heat has to be absorbed by one gram of water is the meaning of the heat capacity to the specific heat of water. Now, one thing to kind of keep in mind here, we see Kelvin used, we could say one degree C as well, that this would be the same increase as one degree C. Now, it might seem confusing at first because you may think, well, the conversion of Kelvin to Celsius isn't one to one, so how can that be true? Well, think of water going from 25 degrees C to 26 degrees C. I think we can all agree that's a one degree increase in temperature. And so the delta T is equal to one degree C for that water sample going through this temperature change. Now, if you convert this to Kelvin, 25 to Kelvin's 298 Kelvin, and then 26 to Kelvin's 299 Kelvin. So if you increase the temperature between 298 to 299 Kelvin is the same temperature difference from 25 to 26 degrees C, the delta T is equal to one Kelvin. So we have to keep in mind, or just realize that a delta T in Kelvin turns out to be equal to a delta T in degree C. And so a lot of times you might see these values written as joules per gram degree C as well. Or sometimes you'll see when I do problems, I might write joules per gram Kelvin and then do the delta T in degree C and they cancel out just fine. So we just have to make sure we don't make a temperature conversion error. We'll see an example of this in a moment uh, where your two temperatures is both have to be in degree C or in Kelvin, and the difference in degree C is equal to the difference in Kelvin. Okay, so let's say we put 10 grams of iron into water. So we put a 10 gram piece of iron at 100 degrees, so we have a hot piece of iron. So maybe we had a, a test tube with a piece of iron in it, and we put that test tube into a boiling water bath for you know 25 minutes to make sure that that piece of iron was at the same temperature of the boiling water. So we have a hot piece of iron. Um, we're gonna put that into water in an isolated system. Now an isolated system is one that can't exchange heat with its surroundings. Um, technically it can't exchange matter either, but this is usually one that you don't necessarily have to seal in. You're just trying to keep the heat enclosed into a system. Again, think of like a Stanley water bottle or whatever. You're just trying to have an insulated cup that um, the heat can exchange from the iron into the water and hopefully not from the water into the greater surroundings of the entire cup or whatever that this reaction is taking place in. And so you have, again, like a piece of hot iron into water, and then you have some sort of insulated cup. And so we'll, we'll, we'll even see um, on the next example that there's a form of calorimetry called coffee cup calorimetry, where the idea of the coffee cup is just meant to be an insulated cup. 
so that you don't have a lot of heat loss from the cup into the surroundings of the cup. And so the hot iron can lose its heat to the water and they can exchange heat until their temperatures are the same. So the iron's at initially 100 degrees C, the water's at 25 degrees C. So the water temperature should go up as the iron temperature drops. Now, something I could have noted on the previous slide, going back is tricky so I don't wanna hit the back button, but if you were to look at the CS of iron, it's about 0.45, I think, I think it may be, it's, it's on the previous slide, but I think it's 0.45 joules per gram Kelvin. That's a lot lower than water. So if you had an equal mass of iron as you did water, the iron's gonna heat up a lot faster. We know this like from cooking. So if you put a cast iron skillet on the stove, turn the stove on, it's gonna be hot in a minute. Uh, if you put the same mass of a pot of water on the stove, it's gonna take it 10 minutes to heat up because it has to absorb a lot more heat in order to increase its temperature due to the difference in specific heat. And same thing here, if we put 10 grams of iron into water where um, we have 100 grams of water, so we have a lot more water, and also the specific heat of water is a lot higher, the water temperature is gonna go up a little bit, the iron temperature is gonna drop by a lot. So what we're gonna see is that they equilibrate until they reach the same temperature. But how can we calculate the temperature that the two end up at? How can we calculate the final temperature? Well, let's just think of the Q is equal to MCS delta T equations that we can write for iron and for water here. So what happens here is that we have the MCS delta T for iron And if we think of the MCS delta T for water, that the heat that's lost by iron is gained by water. So all I need to do is put a sign here of negative in front of one of them. It doesn't matter which side I put it on, right? I can, I can put the negative sign here. I can put the negative sign here. It's not trying to imply that either side of the reaction is negative or either side of the equation is negative. It's trying to imply whatever the sign is for, say, the iron, water sign is the opposite sign. And so I can put the negative sign on either side of this equation. So let's go negative MCS delta T for the iron. Then I have the MCS delta T for water on the other side. And this is just meaning, and this equation is just the equation form of the expression of the saying that we could say that the heat lost by iron is gained by water. have a heat exchange taking place. So what we can then do is we can sort of start thinking, okay, I have a mass of iron, I have the specific heat of iron, so let me keep my minus sign here. So I have 10 grams of iron, I have 0 0.45 joules per gram Kelvin times the delta T. Now let me write the delta T as a delta, the final temperature minus the initial temperature. The initial temperature of iron is 100 degrees C. And that's going to be equal to the mass of water, which is 100 grams, times the specific heat of water. I was going to mention on the previous page why I added the four. Why I added the four is if you happen to know the conversion between calorie and joule, you might know that one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. Now the reason why that's kind of relevant is because the calorie um, is defined by the heat it takes water to raise its temperature by one degree C. It's the, the, defined as a specific heat of liquid water. And so it's kind of interesting that the calorie unit is actually defined precisely by the specific heat of water. So you might have known, this isn't probably a conversion we use too much in this class, but one calorie is 4.184 joules, and there's a good reason for that conversion. It's kind of how the calorie scale was devised. But anyways, just as an aside on calories versus joules, joule is the SI unit of energy, so we use it more commonly. Um, I think OCHEM likes the calorie unit, so you'll see cows or kcals in um, OCHEM. If you look at food labels, those are kilocalories, so when you see a uh, you know, a candy bar or something has 200 calories, that's capital C calories for kilocalories, not something to worry about for this class. But as you think of energy units that you encounter every day, we actually encounter like the kilocalorie unit fairly often. And we don't even realize it because they just put a capital C on the, the unit. Okay, so then we have the delta T of water. 
So we use the delta T of water, so the final temperature of water minus the initial temperature of water, which is 25.0 degrees C. Let me rewrite that. So the TF minus 25.0 degrees C. Now, there's one other key that we just have to make sure we remember here, and then I think we can solve this expression and use algebra, though it's a little bit of a lengthy problem. But the key detail is that the equilibration of energy means that once they equilibrate fully, they reach the same final temperature. So if the iron were still hotter than the water, it still has heat to lose. So as soon as the iron reaches the same temperature as the water, then they have thermally equilibrated. And then we know that's the point at which all the heat from the iron that was available to lose to the water has been lost to the water. And they've reached the same final TF. So in order to solve this expression here, I just have to kind of go through the fairly laborious, but hopefully not tremendously challenging problem of just factoring and rearranging and solving. So I'm going to work out 10 times 0.45. And then that'll be negative 4.5, keeping the minus sign times TF. And then I'm going to have 10 times 0.45 times negative 100. So that's 450 degrees C. So that's just doing this math and then times 100. Just multiplying and then factoring that out. And then can set that equal to 10, or excuse me, 100 times 4.184 times TF. So that's 418.4 times TF. And then just factoring with the 25. So 25 times 100 times 4.184 is 10,460. Okay, and so let's do some further rearranging. So let's subtract 450 from both sides. Signs. And so I have negative 10,460 minus 450. So that's 10,910. So and then let's subtract. 418.4 TF from both sides. So that goes to zero, this went to zero. So that gives me negative 422.9 times TF, so just trying to get TF all onto one side. Divide both sides by negative 422.9. Gives us TF, so TF should be equal to Twenty five point eight zero. So water only went up by eight tenths of a degree here by the ten grams of iron. And that's just due to the specific heat difference and due to the mass difference. We have a lot more of the substance that takes a lot of heat to increase its temperature, and we have a lot less of the substance that doesn't require as much of a high delta T to increase, or as much heat to increase its temperature. 
So water's final temperature and the final temperature of the iron should be 25.80. So that ends up being answer B. But relatively long, but hopefully not tremendously, like, like a fairly laborious example for writing out the math and balancing it and doing the algebra, but hopefully you can see we're just trying to solve for TF in the math here. One last thing I want to come back to is if we kind of go back to our delta T for either one of these, let's say water, TF 25.80 minus the initial temperature 25.00, my delta T for water is plus 0 0.80 degrees C, and that's okay with the Kelvin. We didn't need to worry about any Kelvin or degrees C temperature conversions. I needed to do one of two things here. I either need to leave the initial and final temperatures both in degrees C, or I need to convert both of them to Kelvin. Because their difference, this difference in Kelvin would be equal to 0 0.80 Kelvin. So just think of converting. If you want to convert, convert the initial and final to Kelvin, then take the difference and see that it's still 0 0.80 Kelvin. One thing I've seen a lot of students miss on some of these calorimetry questions is just making mistakes on that temperature conversion. So if you ever find that you're off by about 200 or so orders of magnitude, probably mistakenly converted to Kelvin when you didn't need to. Okay, now in some ways the next example is almost like that previous example, but where instead of putting a hot object into water, what if we put a substance into water that releases heat like calcium chloride? Or what if we put a substance into water that absorbs heat like ammonium nitrate? Could we then take the quantity of substance we put into the water? Can we take the final and initial temperatures to help us determine what the heat change of the reaction was from the heat change we can measure or monitor from the delta T difference of the solution? That's calorimetry. So calorimetry is measure the temperature of the surroundings of the reaction and see what you can learn about the reaction that took place in the solution. So it's very much like putting a piece of hot object or a cold object into water and tracking the temperature change. But here, instead of a hot object or a cold object, it's a reaction leading to the release or absorption of heat. And so the, 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 the sort of calorimeter itself for the coffee cup calorimeter is just an insulated cup. And we can have a solution in the cup. We can have a thermometer. We have maybe a stirring motor just to keep the reaction mixing together. And then it's not totally sealed, so we're not going to really be at anything other than constant pressure still. So you see a cork, but this is really just to keep the contents from splattering and keep everything inside the cup. So we're really not sealing this in um, completely, so we're still at constant pressure. So we're still at constant pressure here. And so let's look at an example, because really when we see this type of problem, there's just a fairly common example like this that goes along with it where what we can do is put a compound into the water, like ammonium nitrite, kind of like nitrate, but notice that this is NO2, not NO3. But we put ammonium nitrite into water inside of one of these calorimeters. So we put two grams of ammonium nitrite into 50 grams of water, initially at 25 degrees C, and then the temperature is lowered after the reaction takes place, and the temperature lowers to 22.24 degrees C. So from the temperature difference right away, can you tell if this reaction is exothermic or endothermic. So solution temperature drops. That's the surroundings. So the heat of the surroundings is dropping because the temperature of the surroundings is dropping. And so that means that the heat of the reaction must be increasing because it has the opposite sign of the heat of the surroundings. So the heat of the surroundings is dropping, it went into the reaction, and so Q reaction must be greater than zero, meaning it must be endothermic. Okay, so when I look at my two choices here, there's only two choices that are endothermic, A and C. So we can roll out B and D right off the bat. So we can roll out B and D because those are exothermic choices. Um, we want to go for the endothermic choice here. Now, Hopefully we can work out mathematically and see that the answer should come out positive if we work this out. How do we work this out mathematically to get an actual number here for the delta H and hopefully get the right sign? Well, let's think about Q reaction first and then from there let's go to delta H. So Q reaction is the negative the heat change of the surroundings of a reaction, just a really fundamental relationship that the heat of the reaction is always the opposite of its surroundings. And the surroundings here is the entire solution. So we have the entire solution acting as the surroundings of the reaction. 
And then my Q reaction here, when I start getting some numbers and start throwing numbers in, this is the reaction that's actually occurring in the cup. So this is for the reaction of two grams So this is the Q reaction for the specific reaction occurring in the cup. Okay. And so when I go to think about the solution, the solution I can think of this as being an MCS delta T for this solution. So I can think of describing the solution by Q is equal to MCS delta T. So I got to keep the minus sign for the minus M solution. So the mass of the solution times CS of the solution and then times the delta T of that solution. That's going to be my Q reaction. So the Q reaction is the opposite of the sign of the Q solution. And so we're told a few details. We can calculate the delta T from the information given. We can calculate the mass of the solution. The solution mass is 52.0 grams. So it's the entire collection of the solute and the water added together. And then we're told to assume that the CS of the solution is the same value of that of water, which is a pretty good assumption because we're, you know, 96% water here. So my mass of the solution, 52.0 grams. So this is the mass of the solute plus the solvent because that's what the solution is. So the mass of the solution, 52 grams times 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin. And then times the TF minus the TI. So 22, probably do that in our heads, but let's not mix, mix this up. 22.24 is the final, 25 is the initial. So it's minus 2.76 degrees C. And that would equal Kelvin, same difference in Kelvin. We don't need a double conversion. This is the double conversion step. Sometimes we make the mistake on. So a common mistake I see is students add 273.15 here to convert to Kelvin. We don't need to do that. If you want to convert to Kelvin, convert the initial temperatures and finals to Kelvin, then take the difference. You'll see it's 2.76 Kelvin, so that these cancel perfectly. So I go 52, or negative 52, times 4.184, times negative 2.76, and I get 600, and then the unit here would be joules, my gram canceled, like degree C and Kelvin canceled. So here I get plus 600.5 joules. I think I should have three sig figs here. Um, so 600 joules. Now, this isn't quite the final answer to the question, but we're really close to the final answer to the question. We also got the right sign. So notice that the Q reaction comes out with the right sign here because I thought about the reaction versus the surroundings relationship with the minus sign and how fundamental that is to be there. The Q reaction is the negative heat of the solution because the solution is the surroundings. That's where that minus sign comes from. And then the TF minus the TI is just literally what delta means. It's the final temperature minus the initial. So I just had to be very careful of setting the final temperature of the water minus the initial. And so that's just from taking this as the TF and then this is the TI and just very fundamental of which one's the final, which one's the initial. And so that gives me the right sign that matches what we expected from thinking of X over sendo to start the problem. And then the last detail I need to do is to kind of take the Q reaction that we found here to go to delta H is just to then think that the problem is asking for the enthalpy of solution of the compound in Kj's per mole. That this would be the enthalpy of the solution process for the two grams. Like this is the delta H here for the, six, the, the 600.5 joules is the delta H when two grams of the compound is reacting. That's like the heat per two grams. If we want the Kj's per mole, we just need to go per mole of that compound. So again, let me go back to the problem. It's getting sloppy because there's a lot of writing here. But it says, what is the enthalpy of solution of this compound in Kj's per mole? 600 joules is the Q reaction. It's the Q reaction of the, the reaction where two grams were reacted. So it's the heat per two grams. And so what we want to do here is just use the molar mass of ammonium nitrite. I think it was given up here, 64.05 grams per mole. So multiply this quantity by 64.05. 
And we just got to go KJ's, joules to kilojoules. So 1,000 joules per kilojoule. So dividing by 1,000, I get 38.5 positive KJ's per mole. Oh, I forgot to divide by two. I forgot to do the divide by two step here. So dividing that by two gets me the 19.2. So 600 divided by two times 64.05 divided by 1,000. Okay, so again, a lot of steps, but hopefully the steps can make sense that we're just taking the heat of the reactions, the negative heat of the solution, the negative sign comes from the Q reactions negative to the surroundings, and then MCS delta T for the solution, we just use the mass solution, CS solution, delta T solution, work that out, and then we just go from joules per gram to kJs per mole, and convert that and solve for the delta H. Now, a couple of thought questions for you guys would be, what would have happened if we used more compound? Like if I ran this reaction again and we set up a new calorimeter, and instead of putting two grams in the, the 50 grams of water, what if I put four grams of the compound into the water? What do you think would happen? Would the temperature drop have been bigger? We probably would have had more reaction taking place, so more heat would have been absorbed, so the temperature loss would have been greater. So if we have more compound reacting, then our delta T magnitude is going to be bigger. What if we use more water? What if I had 100 grams of water here instead of 50? Then the delta T wouldn't have been as high of a magnitude. Our final temperature would have been a little higher. So we would have had more temperature. We had more water to give its heat away, so the temperature of water would have dropped by less. So the solution temperature would have dropped by less. So we can think of some relationships between how we can kind of make changes to this reaction and then how the temperature might adjust itself accordingly. Let's talk about another form of calorimetry. I'm gonna go relatively quick through this, mainly because they tend to never examine on this topic. You know, I think it's really important, um, so I don't wanna skip it, um, because there's a second form of calorimetry. I try to explain to my colleagues all the time, this problem is actually easier to solve. Uh, but a bomb calorimeter is where you have a cell here that's going to be sort of separate from the water you see in the system. You're gonna take a gas cell and you're gonna fill it with a compound, have some lead wires connecting to a sample. You're gonna then fill the cell with oxygen gas. You're gonna to try to purge all the air out of it, get all the N2 out that you can. So you're gonna have a, a cylinder with a large amount of oxygen, certainly in excess of oxygen, where you can detonate a sample or blow up a sample inside the container. So we call this bomb calorimetry because we're sort of burning or blowing up a compound. Then it's always going to be exothermic. So this reaction that takes place in this form of calorimetry always releases heat. So this cell here gets hot. And so then you have it in a water bath with a stirring motor and a thermometer. So we put a thermometer on the surroundings of that container. So this thing gets hot. So the temperature increases in our water bath. So we see that temperature go up. So we see the temperature increase here. And then we can track that delta T or the change in water temperature and relate it back to how much heat was lost by the chemical reaction that occurred in the cup. So the problems look very similar to the coffee cup problems that we just solved, but we're gonna see one big change that actually simplifies the problem. And that is when we read through the problem, we have a sample of a compound, turns out to be uh, heptane, I believe, is a, or an isomer of heptane. It's combusted in a bomb calorimeter with excess oxygen. At the bomb calorimeter, we're given a total heat capacity that includes all the water that surrounds the calorimeter. And notice that the units are kJs per Kelvin. So bomb calorimetry simplifies down this way. Bomb calorimetry simplifies down to still starting Q reactions, negative Q of the surroundings. So the heat of the reaction is the opposite of the sign of the surroundings. The surroundings here is just the entire calorimeter. So this is just the entire calorimeter. So the heat of the calorimeters, so you track the temperature change of the entire calorimeter. That's the water surrounding the cell. And then this just has one value, a CCAL. And we multiply that by delta T. So this is CCAL. So the heat capacity of the calorimeter. So that's this number here. 
and then times the delta t. So there's no mass unit involved anywhere here. So there's no mass of solution. There's, so there's no mass term here at all. So we don't need a mass term to get Q reaction. We'll see the mass of the compound comes in the next step. It kind of comes in that final Q reaction to delta H step like we did previously in the last problem. But so here we would just take Q reaction is just negative 10.94 kJs per Kelvin and then times our delta T. And our delta T here, it goes up by 6.589 degrees. So a positive temperature change. I'm intentionally writing degrees C and Kelvin to cancel out just so that we know that they cancel and we don't have to do any special conversions. And so if I do that math, so 10.94 negative times 6.589 is 72.08. So if I want to get my delta H and kJs per mole, I'm going to take that Q reaction I just got, and I need to divide by whatever limited that reaction. Like previously, what I divided by was the mass of the solute. Here I want the enthalpy of combustion of the compound. So we want to divide by the mass of the compound. So we want to divide here by 1.50 grams of the compound. I've had classes where in the past I've asked for like the kJs per gram. That like confuse everybody. And it just literally would be this kJs divide by the grams saving you the next step. But most of the time you want the kJs per mole of the compound. What's the heat of combustion per mole of the compound? Well, we just convert using the molar mass. So we have 100, it's right in the right spot, 100.21 grams per mole of that compound. So the grams cancel, we get our kJs per mole. So we're already in KJs, we don't need a mass term, we just have a C-Cal times a delta T, um, and then we just take the Q reaction, divide it by the mass of the compound, convert to moles, and I get negative 4,815, rounds to 4,816 KJs per mole. So all the choices were exothermic, but maybe on a test question, half of them are exothermic, or maybe I'll ask you, is this exothermic or endothermic? A compound burning or combusting always has to be, the burning is the heat given off, so we know that's going to be exothermic. We can see it from the temperature increase in the calorimeter as well. The surroundings temperature went up because the reaction released heat into the solution. Okay, so this technique here like, is used to determine um, enthalpies of reaction. This is one of the important techniques that determines enthalpies of reaction. When we get into the topic of enthalpies of formation um, here in a little bit, we're going to see that those values come from experiments like this too. So a lot of our experimental values are coming from either bomb calorimetry examples or solution examples like a coffee cup calorimeter. This is how we measure and determine delta H's in the lab. There are other techniques, but these are some of the primary techniques that have been used to determine the delta H's for a wide range of types of reactions. Okay, so a quick summary here. Um, the exothermic versus endothermic reactions. Exothermic reactions release heat, solution temperature goes up. Um, the surroundings temperature goes up by the exothermic reaction. Endothermic reactions decrease the temperature of the surroundings because they are absorbing heat from the surroundings. Q reactions, negative Q surroundings, just a fundamental relationship for, uh, for every reaction, every system in its surroundings. This is true for all reactions versus their surroundings. And then we see um, delta H is equal to QP for an open system. We use this in our coffee cup calorimetry problem, so calculating delta H is the Q. Um, and then using the Q reaction negative Q solution, MCS delta T solution, and then working out Q reaction after the problem by taking the heat released in that reaction per gram, working out per mole. And the same thing here. Technically, I didn't really stress this, but bomb calorimetry, the cell's at constant volume, um, but we don't worry about any work changes here in this form of calorimetry. So we still use our Q reactions, negative Q of the calorimeter, negative C cal times delta T. And then we just have to work out the kJs per gram to kJs per mole at the end of the problem. So there's plenty of practice problems on these. I'd probably focus more on the coffee cup examples 
the, I think the bomb calorimetry problems are perfectly easy, and there's no reason not to, to find those problems easy as well. But, um, but they tend to focus exam questions on the coffee cup solution problems more than the, the bomb calorimetry problems. So there's like two last sections in the book that, that kind of will come together pretty easily, hopefully, here. Hess's law, we've already kind of mentioned it, is how we can take reactions and kind of add them together to get new reactions. Um, so if we can add reactions up, we can just sort of add up their enthalpies. So let's take a look at an example that uses Hess's law. So an idea would be, like let's say we want to know the delta H of this reaction here, NO plus O goes to NO2, and that we have given NO plus ozone goes to NO2 plus O2, um, and then we also have ozone goes to O2, we also have O2 goes to the O atom. So we have three individual reactions given, none of them correspond to the desired reaction, but can I put these together like a puzzle? So can I try to solve a puzzle where I try to take these reactions here and see how do I have to manipulate these equations? Do I need to flip the reactions? Do I need to cut them in half, the coefficients? Do I need to change the coefficients? And if we flip a reaction, we just have to remember we flip the sign of delta H. If we double the coefficients, we have to double the magnitude of delta H. So we're just trying to put a puzzle together on this type of Hess's law question. And so one way I start the problem is I just look for a substance that appears in just one of the reactions. So like NO, is only in one of the three reactions. So I can start and know that this first reaction has to be written as is. Everything's gas-based, so I'm going to leave off the um, gas tags for everything. One thing you have to be a little careful of is sometimes water liquid might be in the reaction, maybe water gas is in the reaction. Just do a quick inspection to see if you have to worry about the physical state. Um, the physical state depends on, or the delta H depends on physical state. So if you have water liquid versus water gas, those reactions would have different delta H's. So we just have to sometimes be careful, but these are all gases. So I'm just going to neglect and not worry about writing gas every time. So the first reaction I'm using as is, so I haven't changed or flipped the reaction. So the delta H is still minus 198.9 kJs. And so if I notice ozone's not in my overall balanced reaction, like, so there's no O3, so somehow I gotta get O3 onto the product side to cancel out with it. And one other thing I can maybe see before I worry about that is that I need an O atom on the reactant side, and the only reaction that has an oxygen atom is the last one. So my very last reaction has an O atom, but I don't need to flip it to get it onto the reactant side, because I need this to add up where O atom is on the opposite side. So if I flip the reaction to two O atoms forming an O2, that the delta H here would be equal to minus 495 kJs. So real quick thought on O2 to O, we're like breaking a bond. So breaking a bond takes energy. We'll see that topic come up again later, but bringing two atoms together releases energy. And so, um, so anyways, all I did was flip this reaction, so I flipped the sign of delta H accordingly, and then I only have one O atom on that reactant side, and so I can cut these coefficients in half. So that gives me um, one O atom goes to a half O2. Now, the way this works is a half a mole of oxygen atom converts into half, excuse me, one mole of O atoms converts into half a mole of O2. So think of having 6.022 times 10 to the 23 turning into about three times 10 to the 23 molecules of O2. So you might get confused on fractional coefficients, but remember, this is just half a mole of water and this is one mole of oxygen atom. So just think of those coefficients being moles, and I think the fractions are something you can imagine and understand. But so then we just have to cut the 495 in half. So I need to take negative 495, divide by two. So that's minus 248. So again, I flip this reaction, and I cut the coefficients in half. So the initial delta H was multiplied by negative one half. And then I can't just add these up still because these reactions would add up to NO plus O3 plus O goes to NO2 plus O2 plus a half O2. That's not the overall reaction that we want to know the delta H of. So we got to use the middle reaction to balance out and cancel the ozone. And hopefully that will take care of the O2 as well. And so if I flip the reaction here to put ozone on the product side, I do that so that it cancels. 
And then I put the 3 halves O2 over here on the reactant side. So 3 halves O2 goes to ozone. Delta H of this reaction would be the opposite sign. So plus 142.3 kJs. And so then let's see how these two now add together. So the enthalpy of O3 cancels out with the enthalpy of O3 on the product side. So if I have a reactant on the reactant and product side, I can cancel it out. It's not part of the net change as well, if you think of sort of like net ionic equations. So we also have an O2 plus a half O2 that combines the three halves O2, which cancels out with our three halves O2. And so adding these three reactions up, just imagine you kind of mathematically add the equations, maybe this version of reactions, I don't mind the word equations as much, because we end up with NO plus O goes to NO2 in terms of our net reaction. And then the delta H accordingly should be the sum of these three delta H's, but precisely the manipulated delta H's. So minus 198.9. Plus negative 248. Plus 142.3. So that gives me minus 305. So reactions always have units of just kJs. The mole is understood to be whatever the moles are in the reaction. So the mole, you don't see kJs per mole here because this is like per mole of reaction where the reaction is one mole of NO plus one mole of O goes to one mole of NO2. Just remember these problems here is all about how do I add these reactions up? What, what changes do I need to make so I can make the necessary changes to the delta H values to add them up? Sometimes we get confused in thinking that we can manipulate the reactions, but then just add these up as is. You can't add them up as is. You have to see how these reactions need to be flipped. So we flipped the middle reaction, we flipped the bottom reaction, cut it in half, and kept the top one as is. And these problems here are just like a puzzle. So if you can solve the puzzle for Hess's Law problems, you'll find these problems to be pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Bunch of examples on the daily quizzes. Um, so just, I would take a look at a couple of them and make sure you kind of get the idea. Uh, manipulate the reactions, but also make the same modifications to the delta H. So then the last topic of chapter five are enthalpies of formation. And so formation enthalpies, we're gonna see our values, if we knew these, we can use them to kind of predict or calculate a delta H of reaction. So if you imagine you have like 2A goes to B, we could calculate the delta H of this reaction if we knew the enthalpy of B minus two times the enthalpy of A. The problem or the challenge is it's hard to measure an absolute enthalpy of a compound. If we did so, it would actually be a very large number, like on the orders of hundreds of thousands of negative kJs per mole. But one of the things that's easier to measure is the change in enthalpy of one substance to another, or the enthalpy it takes to form a substance from its elements. So an alternate approach would be if we knew or could quantify what we call the formation enthalpies of a compound, the formation enthalpies are where we form one mole of a compound from whatever its elements are, where the elements are in their most standard state. So these are the elements in their most stable form at 298 Kelvin, at 25 degrees C. So the most stable form of carbon at room temperature is graphite. The most stable form of oxygen is O2. Oxygen can form O3, but that's not more stable than O2. So O2 is the most stable form of oxygen. So a formation reaction for, say, water would be the most stable form of hydrogen, the elemental form of hydrogen at room temperature is H2 gas. Oxygen is a half O2. Formation reactions are actually the one reaction you can leave with fractions in them, and they are actually perfect that way. It would be wrong to get rid of the, the fraction. So you're making one mole of the compound, and the enthalpy it takes to make that compound from its elements is defined to be the formation enthalpy of that compound. So the delta HF of CO2 is the enthalpy it takes to form CO2 from its elements, and then the enthalpy it takes to form water gas is the enthalpy from its elements, and then the enthalpy to form water liquid is a little different. Notice that the delta HF of water in the liquid state is not the same as water in the gaseous state, uh, but it's still the same enthalpy from H2 plus O2, but just forming water liquid. And so what we can use delta HFs for is we can use these in the same way we might have used absolute enthalpies, where we can take the delta HF 
of B minus two times the delta HF of A to calculate our delta H of reaction. So we can use those like they were the enthalpy values if we had listed, we could calculate the delta H of reactions. The way this is going to work is that these delta HFs are defined to be zero. Because if you're an element in your most stable state, then your delta H is the formation of yourself from the same substance. So O2 gas from O2 gas, this would have a delta H defined to be precisely zero. So let's pick up from this next time that elements are defined to have zero delta HF values. Compounds will tend to have non-zero delta HF values. And we can use all these ideas or values together to calculate delta H's of reaction. OK, so we'll pick up and continue with the slide, kind of go back over it, review it, and push forward and get into some review topics of chapters four and five and that little end of three. All right, guys, have a great day.